Hello and welcome to episode 30 of MMO Weekly, presented as always by MetsmerizedOnline.com. I'm your host, Sal Manzo, along with my co-host and MMO executive editor, Mike Mayer. Mike, happy new year, happy holidays. Uh, the last time we spoke, it was uh, uh, the year before, and uh, there was a deal supposedly with Carlos Correa, but a lot has happened in the last uh, week and a half or so. Um, you know, just want to get your thoughts with all this that's going on. Yeah, I think since the Mets signed Correa or had an agreement in place, I've gained about 12 pounds and like two <laughs> inches on my beard. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, we're getting into two weeks on this thing. Yeah, I think it is exactly two weeks since um, the late night report from Heyman that said the Mets had an agreement in place for Correa. Um, obviously, I know we're going to get into it pretty deep here, but I think ultimately, I think – I mean, a lot of deals. Uh, Andrew Benintendi was announced on December 19th, I think it right. was, and was just made official today. Um, there's other deals that took over a week. It's just a matter of hey, a lot of, A lot of these people just simply weren't working right. that had in baseball, um, lawyers, agents. I mean, you got a lot of folks that are enjoying the holidays. Um and a lot of pla- even more places now. I know the place where I work even started having more um, holidays on both ends of Christmas and New Year's. So there's there's a lot less that goes on in that time span. So uh, I I don't think I don't think at this point I know it's frustrating, but I don't think it really should be surprising at this point that we're 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 going two weeks on this. Uh, we'll we'll get into it more too. But with JD Martinez, his took a week. Right. Um, and that was a five year deal they were working on. Um, they're working on a 12 year, $315 million original deal. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's going to take some time and both sides want to get it done. So, I, I, I don't think time is a huge issue for them. Yeah. And like you said, you know, this is, it's a, it's potentially a 12 year, 300 plus million dollar deal. So, you know, if there's going to be every, um, every loose end that needs to get tied up for that to be official. Like I understand all that. Um, I guess more so I, I want to talk about like this, this ankle of Correa's obviously, you know, it scared the giants off enough to, to call off their deal. Um, obviously it's paused the Mets now with the physical part. They're trying to rework, you know, rework things with the, with the deal that they originally had agreed upon. But, you know, are you surprised at all as far as just the, the hang up now with two different teams with this? Um, do you think that this, um, I, I don't. I guess leverage is the right word. Do you think that the Mets kind of have the leverage right now? Because it, let's say this deal falls through, I would assume Correa is not getting a long-term deal with a third team if that's the case with it's supposedly an injury risk. Um, you know, I just want to get your thoughts on all that. You know, it's a. Uh, uh, I know you mentioned Martinez, but this is certainly you know something that uh, seems to be a little a uh, little out of the ordinary, especially after Cohen had made comments about it publicly as well about the deal getting done. Yeah, so I think. It's tough to say one side has more leverage than the other just because there's issues on both sides. I mean, right. the obvious issue for Cray is that he now has two teams that have basically said, well, we got to pump the brakes on this deal and it just might not happen. So I think that obviously Korea doesn't want to go back to the free agent market. Mm-hmm. I mean, essentially right now he'd probably be looking at like, going back to the twins, right? right and right. whatever the twins are willing to give him, um, maybe the giants get back into it. Cause they didn't really spend a ton of that money. And the giants, they've kind of come out and said they were willing to, it, it seemed like they were willing to negotiate more mm-hmm. um, with Crea, but it Boris wanted to move on pretty quickly. And it, it's tough to kind of blame him because he knew that the Mets had interest. So right. at that time, is a completely different scenario than say Craya hits the open market again now. Um, and they know the giants have already seen the medical. So they, they would be kind of prepped on what they would need to do in terms of an agreement and everything. But yeah, so I mean, it would be really tough for Correa to be like, Nope, I'm not agreeing to this because he, he's certainly going to lose out on the potential for money mm-hmm. and the potential for years, even if he um, signs with someone else, I think uh, like Ken Rosenthal said, the likelihood of this being 12 years, 317 million guaranteed is 
pretty much out the window. Um, right. We don't we don't know the terms yet. We know mm-hmm. that there's going to be a bunch of different things in there, which we'll get into later. But and then on the Mets side, I mean, it's been a terrific off season for the Mets before this. Um, and Cohen wants to continue that. It would be at this point two weeks in. It would look pretty bad on the Mets end if there was at some point there's like, no, we're not doing this and we're, we're backing out of this. Um, it would look bad on that end. They also not a ton of options to improve the way you would with Crea. Um, right. I know that they had at least in the back of their mind and had talked to the Red Sox at one point about Rafael Devers um, just to gauge what he would cost. Well, now that's not happening anymore yep. because he's going to be a Red Sox for life. So there's one of those backup options that's gone. So that, I mean, in essence, that really does put some more pressure on the Mets to get this done because there, there just isn't any other options to add that type of bat at third base. Um, and like you said, Steve Cohen said that they had a deal. Right. Um, it doesn't happen. Um, right. Owners, GMs, and People don't say stuff on the record like that until a deal is official. And it wasn't official. And Cohen said something. Um, that's going to be an issue if the Mets back out of this deal, regardless of the fact that there is a medical, seems to be a consensus medical issue with Korea. It still would be an issue in a grievance sense for the Mets if they backed out of this because of what Cohen said. So, I think ultimately there's pressure on both sides, but I, I think you would probably have to say Correa has the most to risk here by right. walking away from the deal. Um, simply because this is two teams at that point, it would be two teams that just weren't willing to deal with you. And we're getting close. I mean, we're five weeks away from pitchers and catchers. Yep. So it's creeping up. I mean, you, you don't see a ton of big deals yeah. this late in the season. And I mean, The Red Sox just made a big deal. Um, There's other teams that have kind of made some other moves. So it's there wouldn't be a whole lot of eggs in his basket, if you would, to kind of make sure that he got another big deal. Um, And it would be tough just – I think it would be tough just from the standpoint of um, now knowing that two teams have essentially pointed out something in your medical history. Um, In any negotiation, that's the first thing that team – say the Minnesota twins that are going to bring up, be like, well, we know this for a fact. And we know that two medical professionals have, or teams of medical professionals have an issue with the long-term viability of this. And so you kind of asked about that. So I'll touch on that real quick. Um, From my understanding. And again, I I'm not in the medical profession whatsoever or in the law profession or insurance, but from my understanding is that, the Giants and Mets doctors both had an issue with it, but um, insurance companies also had an issue with ankle injury long term, which is obviously a holdup. Um, mm-hmm. Any time you're putting out a contract of these sizes, you obviously want to have that player insured, um, that contract insured um, to the best of your ability to the max that you can in how many different areas you can, because that that's a big risk. I mean, any, any player that's a big risk for $300 million, 12 years. So from my understanding is that the insurance um, agencies were going to have an issue with that ankle as well. So, I mean, which makes sense. I mean, that that's at, at first we're like when the Giants said it, everyone was laughing right. and like, wow, this is something from 2014. He's played eight years and nothing's happened. And now that the Mets doctors and kind of said the same thing about the long-term viability of it. Right. And obviously the insurance companies kind of have an issue with it. I mean, it, it, it brings some validity to obviously, I mean, to what the giants did. I mean, I think they can feel a little better about what they did, but uh, it just kind of makes sense from a medical standpoint too. Now that you have a couple of, I mean, we're, it's not like we're talking three or four years down the road. Right. We're talking, right. 9, 10, 11, yeah. you, you, you don't, even though you kind of counting that maybe a year or two, maybe right. a shot in the contract, right. you, you don't want to be worried about four or five years yeah. if you right. think that ankle is going to be an issue in f- six to seven. Yeah. So uh, 
th- that's something both teams are looking at. That's something the Mets are looking at. And that that's why this thing is just really, really complicated. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you mentioned the ankle, right? It was, uh, he had surgery on 2014 when he was 19 or whatever it was. I did read that uh, part of the hang up possibly is that in September of the season, he either tweaked or injured, aggravated that ankle that kind of brought this up to begin with. Um, but, you know, I, I agree that both sides, the Mets and Correa, have too much to lose. Um, I do find it interesting, and I don't know if it's because, again, you know, you can't – you don't want to leave a second suitor on the table, you know, because it'll hurt Correa uh, here with trying to find another team. But obviously, as soon as the Giants backed out and they were willing to negotiate or renegotiate, Boris Camp said no. They went right to the Mets and tried and struck a deal at the time. Um, you know, it's been two weeks. Obviously, other teams have called in checked in and it sounds like it's you know it's they're working with the Mets to try and get this thing done so I do find that interesting whether it's because again you know there may not be other suitors for the you know the the kind of contract that he wants but I do think it may play to the fact that you know he may want to be a Met all along right and that just may also help them ultimately yeah I mean I think there's no secret that Cray is pretty excited about the chance to play with Lindor and um, the Mets have other Puerto Ricans on the team too. So it, it's a good fit for him. Um, and obviously I, I think he would relish the being able to play in New York too. Um, yeah. I think Correa wants to be a Met and that's kind of like you said, Boris, well, the Mets kind of came into it late. They right. talked to him late. So think about that, that Boris had Cohen on the mind right. and we talk about a relationship too. We, we, we know that, um, Cohen has kind of already built a strong relationship um, with Boris. And that's another key point to how this kind of got done so quickly in the first place, but also another key point for why it should get done. Um, neither of them want to break that relationship. Right. Um, Cohen, because Boris is going to represent a lot of the best clients in baseball and Boris, because he doesn't want to piss off the, Biggest uh, owner, owner in baseball who's yep. got all that money to spend when he's right. got some big time clients. So yep. I think that's kind of another side that you look at is just another reason why. Yeah, it just makes too much sense for it to get done because Cohen and Boris, aside from the Correa Mets thing, right? they want this to get done, too. Yep. Um, and neither of them want this on their face either. Right. I mean, it would obviously be a bad look for Boris if he wasn't able to uh, secure a contract for Korea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that relationship's important too. And I think, I think one thing to kind of keep an eye on, um, or at least as talking point that Ken Rosenthal um, brought up on his podcast mm-hmm. is h- how this ends up working out. I mean, like the giant said that Korea is only talking to one team. Right. Um, there's been no reports. I've heard nothing to suggest that Boris is talking to any other team. So, mm-hmm. I mean, at this point, I feel like it's just a matter of when, not if this gets done. So I, I think it's going to get done. So the next point is how is the relationship between Korea and the Mets going to be um, coming off the deal getting done? Um, right. Obviously, I mean, there, there's going to be, there's naturally going to be some contention just into getting the deal done. I mean, right. Correa's not going to end up getting the deal that he wanted. I mean, we know that. Right. Um, so how, how how can the Mets kind of skirt on that line of, hey, we want to make sure that we get this deal done because we, we want him to be a part of the team, but and we want to make sure that we protect ourselves enough, right. but make sure they do that without kind of slapping – Cray in the sure. face. Um, and I, th- I think that's an important thing to do because regardless of what the an- going on with the ankle or how the contract is made out, there's still a chance that he's going to be a Met for, I mean, a long period of time. Right. It's just right. a matter of what the long period is. So, sure. so this isn't a guy you want to feel, um, you don't want to tick him off or right. make him have any sort of angst towards the organization just to start off his long career with the Mets. So I, I think that's kind of something that hasn't been talked about much, but I think that's a fine line there too, to make sure that Korea is happy. Sure. Uh, I agree with you there. You obviously don't want to start off with sour grapes, but I will say it's, you know, just uh, I'm thinking as far as, you know, if they do sign a deal, 
right. It's probably not going to be the 12 years, 300 plus million, but you would think it'd be closer to the eight to 10 year range. Uh, you know, a lot of close to 300 million, something, whatever. And if he's going to sign with the team, I think he'll be happy no matter what, because he's going to have, uh, you know, security, not only financially, but long term where he knows where he'll be living. Going to play with one of his best buddies in Lindor if that happens. And I think another thing, too, we got to remember is, you know, you're talking about the relationship between Boris and Cohen now. You know, there's a different level of respect as far as Boris with the Mets franchise now. It's not like it was five years ago. I think he understands that he's dealing with someone, Steve Cohen, who is an extremely smart business person. And while, yes, he's going to spend and make his team as competitive as possible, he's going to do it in a way that's still going to help his business, right, to cover his backside, so to speak. And I'm sure Boris respects that and understands that. And like you said, he's also you know, not going to want to tick off Cohen, who's got the most money in the sport, and he's going to keep that relationship open. So I think once the deal gets done, I think everything will be peachy keen. You know, they'll, they'll do the press conferences. They'll get rolling. I think once he puts the jersey on, you can kind of move on. Um, interesting the other day in his Instagram story with this with his son with the uh, the iHeart New York shirt there with the hot dog and the pretzel. Great shirt. They should make that adult sizes. I'd buy the heck out of that. Um, and Correa had the uh, the glove with the orange um, the orange lettering and embroidering and stuff. So you know a little subliminal. Who knows there? Um, but you know I think at the end of the day that uh, it's something that they'll they'll be able to get done. Like we we've talked about. You know you said it's not a an, a when not an if. And as far as the injuries concerned, I do think and we'll get into this. This will probably be a good transition. Him moving to third base and guys on currently on the roster, right? Could change. We'll talk about in a second, like Guillaume, um, Escobar, and also Brett Beatty, who I would assume is going to make the roster show. We've talked about. You can get Correa off his feet between the DH role and guys that you have on the bench that if you want to, you know, give him a day off his feet here and there, so to speak, I think they'll be able to cover that. I think they could keep him healthy enough and productive enough where you know, in the next few years, it won't be uh, a huge issue. Like we, like you said, the back end of a contract, you never know. But I think at least for the foreseeable future, they have the stuff in place that can, you know, that maximize his potential, so to speak. But, you know, I guess that's kind of a good transition. We're talking about Guillaume, uh, I mentioned Guillaume and Escobar. Um, if they do sign Correa, the, you know, the latest buzz is that the Mets will try and trade Guillaume or Escobar for the right price. Um, we heard that, they were in talks with the Tigers, possibly with uh, Escobar, um, throwing Gregory Soto out there, possibly as you know, uh, trade partners with the Tigers and the Mets. Do you agree that the Mets should look to do something like that? Get you know, shorten their bench, so to speak, trade an Escobar to get an arm back, or do you think that that maybe even if they do sign Correa, they should keep a guy like es Escobar and Guillaume because really guys like that can lengthen out the bench a ton for a team and you know for. An older team, um, and even like Correa, you know, maybe possibly injury concerns. You, you know, you want to have some production there in case guys go down and need the spell. So I'm just wondering what you think as far as that stuff's concerned. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways the Mets could go with this. And I know we, we talked about it a little bit when they signed Correa. Mm -hmm. um, I think Escobar is going to certainly be a team, uh, a player that teams are looking for. I mean, this late in the season – they missed out on this bat or right. this bat, and I mean, he's, he's a he's a cheap um, he's a cheap bat. I mean, he's got one year, uh, ten million left on his contract with the Mets. So that, I mean, that's a and an option, but uh, so that's that's something good that a team. I mean, if you put him on the free agent market right now, he's arguably one of the best hitters available. Sure, um, and so. The, the Mets could get something back. I, I I know it struggled to start the year, but I right. he was great at the end of the year. He's got a pretty good track record of being a solid offensive player. Um, can play third and second, um, switch hitter. So I think I, I think you could probably get an arm back for him, maybe an arm and a prospect. Uh, and look, the the Mets still want to improve the bullpen if they can. Right. right. And I I also think you just have to look at. The um, you have to look at the roster. I mean, right. right now the Mets just have too many guys for their roster um, and position players that aren't optionable. So someone's going to have to go. I, I obviously Darren Ruff is the obvious one where you you just like to simply dump him if you can. But but then you I mean then you still have Giorme and Escobar as the backup infielders. Um, obviously Escobar probably is the player that has more I, – I guess you could probably argue between the two for 2023. It's, pr it's probably close sure. because 
I think Guillaume is obviously better at shortstop right, than right. Escobar, and he's just a better all around defender than Escobar. Um, and Esco- I mean, Guillaume, you have more control of. So right. between the two of those guys, I, I think the Mets really would have to decide what they're looking for for a bench player. Um, are you looking for more of someone that's going to be important to pinch hit, which Escobar would certainly fill that role better than Guillaume would? Um, I, I think if they do trade from those two, I, I think it probably would be Escobar mm-hmm. um, simply because I, I think teams are going to look at him a little bit more because of what I said, uh, where we're at in the off season and the ability to get a veteran bat. Um, there's just not many out there. And to be able to get that pretty cheap, I think it's valuable to teams. And uh, I mean, let, let's face it. When, when's the last time you saw a glove first guy, get traded as right. kind of like for a piece. I mean, right. he, he certainly has value. I'm not trying to um, put down Giorme or the value that he has to the Mets or any other team, but it's just not that typical guy that you see on the trade market. Um, so I think, I think, and I think the Mets probably, if they had to choose between those two, um, I think they would probably rather keep Giorme too, just because of um, the value he brings in his uh, utility. Um, and it, but he's cheaper than Escobar too. I know. I know yeah. we don't yep. talk about money anymore because it's the new Steve Cohen Mets. Right. But obviously, I mean, he's Cohen's not an idiot. If he if he can shed a little money and still get a piece back, I mean, right. That's obviously something they're they're still going to look at. I mean, it makes sense to do that. I mean, we've talked about it with Carlos Carrasco. It would make some sense to um, trade him too if if that's what they decide to do. Um, and maybe the Mets just say, screw it. And like, we're just going to go with the best team we possibly can into spring training. And if rough is terrible, still we cut them. And we just try to go into it with the best team we can. Maybe someone gets hurt and kind of these roster issues fill out themselves. Um, it's certainly possible to do that too. But it, you're, the Mets are certainly going to get calls on Escobar. And it, it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. Yeah, and you know, I, I between the two, I would also again, I, I'm agreement there as far as I I would be willing to let Escobar go because I think you get a little more, uh, to, you know, as far as he's got more pop than Guillaume, and like you said, you know, he's he'd be one of the better bats, you know, left on the market now if he was a free agent. Um, it would be nice to have him on the bench as a as a pinch hitter. I think that would lengthen them out a lot. But ultimately, I am in agreement. I think Guillaume's glove and defensive versatility just makes him more valuable to the Mets. And he had a good offensive year last year when he played. I think he hit over 300. Kind of came into his own. Um, you know, obviously, it's it's not gonna you know maybe hit 15 home runs like uh, like an Escobar, but he's serviceable at multiple positions on the infield, more than serviceable, and he proved that he could handle the bat a little bit now. So I think that that would be fine. And you mentioned Carrasco as far as another trade piece. Um, not the projections matter. Uh, the the pro- early projections for Sanga, I forget. I don't know if it was – I forget which site that did it. Um, didn't project great. He had like a four-and-a-half ERA, something like that. Obviously, it doesn't mean much. Nothing's happened yet. But as far as starting pitching goes, I do feel like I would keep your as many as you can. I know Carrasco would get some back and it would shed again a little, you know, some salary. It's 14 million, whatever it is, would shed some salary. But I wouldn't be too quick on trading away, you know, starting pitching just yet. We know how the sport is now. You know who the two guys are at the top. They are older. It's an older rotation. Not that Carrasco is younger himself, but he proved last year as a back end starter, especially against bad teams. He's more than serviceable and took the ball every fifth day. Um, I just feel like that that would be uh, ultimately – you know, maybe too, too much of a, a short-sighted decision. I think the, mo- the more starting pitching that they could have, the better. I don't know if you agree there, but that's just something that I was thinking about. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of – the other thing I go to in that is David Peterson. Sure. Uh, I think there's a really good chance that David Peterson probably outpitches Carlos Carrasco in 2023. And right now he's your sixth starter. Um, obviously, that's not a bad thing right. that you have someone as good as Peterson as your sixth starter. But also, like we talked about, I mean, again, the money's not – it's tough because we're talking about how much money they spend. But yeah. it, ultimately, there's still going to be some deals um, that are made with money in mind. Like right. there's going to be some reasons or ways that the Mets want to – cut payroll a little bit yeah. that there's potential for that. And Carrasco certainly does that. And um, 
you certainly have a guy you can plug right in with Peterson. And like I said, I, I think if we looked back at the end of the season and both of them made the same amount of starts, I, I think there's a fairly good chance that Peterson pitches just as well as Carrasco. Right. Uh, Carrasco's another year older. Um, I don't think his stuff was great last year. Um, and I think Peterson's stuff was pretty good. And he came up in some big roles for the Mets. And I think he's improving. I, I think that Peterson's shown that he's improving. And I mean, it, it you don't need it, but it, it also doesn't have, it doesn't hurt to have a lefty starter. Um, yeah. I mean, again, we could be talking about all this and Cohen could tell Apple to be like, screw it. Just keep everyone. We'll just go in with the best team. This is what I want to do. And let's win a world series this year. Um, very likely. I mean, the Mets aren't, I, I think once they get the, this deal done with Korea, mm-hmm. um, I don't think the Mets are done anyway, uh, whether right. it's maybe they do trade one of these guys, but I, I do think there's still a potential for an outfielder. I mean, huh. They, they kind of have to. They're back up for – I mean, they're fourth outfielder right now on the depth chart, um, not counting Jeff McNeil as Khalil Lee. So, obviously, you want some more depth there. And I think they'd still like to get a bullpen piece. I mean, mm-hmm. they weren't done. They were full bore ahead when this Korea thing happened, and they were talking to teams about other options. So, I think once they get this done and they can finally focus elsewhere, I, I think there's still a couple of small pieces that they like to add. Sure. And it's funny, you know, and, and the signing of Correa, and we talked about when we thought it first happened a couple of weeks ago, you sign Correa. Now your fourth outfielder, you have him. That becomes Brett Beatty. And, you know, in, in my mind, at least, you know, he'll platoon. I would assume he uh, fourth outfielder platoon account in left field. You get the lefty righty split. Um, you know, I agree that they're going to add another bullpen on maybe two. It depends on whether they do it via trade or, you know, try and, you know, sign some more guys via free agency or something like that. But I agree that there's a couple of more small moves to be made, but it seems like, you know, as far as the Mets are concerned, that that Correa is that that icing on the cake for this offseason. And I I agree, you know, so whenever it gets done, uh, it's going to be really great. We just, you know, it would be nice to have it sooner than later. I don't, I don't like obsessively uh, refreshing Twitter every day for the last two weeks. So if they can get that done now, holidays are over. That would be wonderful. You know, Steve. Cohen Absolutely. And I, I think so. I mean, the next podcast we'll have is talking about like in depth about the contract because i mean yep um ken rosenthal said once this deal gets done it's going to be drastically different right um so one thing i kind of wanted to note was we've mentioned a little bit that um boris has done this before um he had a deal with the red sox in 2018 with jd martinez that again was agreed upon uh they had some issues from his previous uh the previous season with a liz frank injury um, that they had some questions about. So they, right. they worked they worked for a week, and they ended up changing the deal a little bit. It didn't end up mattering, I think, is the thing to note at first. Um, and Rosenthal mentioned it a little bit on the podcast, too. It's called an exclusion clause, which essentially makes it so you work into the contract if they miss a certain amount of time. Right. Um, that op- – the years, some of the years in the deal would become option years. Gotcha. Um, and so for a, a little bit of an example, I'll uh, kind of read over the JD Martinez deal. So again, it, it was still the five years, 110 million, but right. um, if he was on the disabled list for 60 days or more in the previous season, or on the disabled list for 10 days or more in the previous season and 120 days or more in the two previous seasons combined, or on the disabled list at the end of the previous season and found not able to play at the start of the season, the last two years of that contract became mutual options. Gotcha. Which essentially means it gave the Red Sox the opportunity to um, opt out of that deal if that's what they wanted to do or not pick up the option. Right. Um, and that was tied to the injury that he had previously. So my understanding is uh, there's going to be some of those um, mutual options exclusion clause, I guess is the right way to term it, but mutual options that turn into uh, Mets protection. That's what it does right. is they word it in there so that if Correa misses a certain amount of games or on the disabled uh, injured list for a certain amount of time um, before year X, Y, Z, that they then would have a mutual option instead of that being a guaranteed year. Um, and then it leaves it up to Mets to 
kind of test. I mean, obviously their team doctors will be the ones on top of everything. So they can kind of get an idea of the severity of what they think and uh, potentially uh, get out of the contract. I think, um, and that was a five-year deal. And the last two years of that deal were tied into those clauses. So we're thinking about a 12-year deal. I think right. it would certainly be more than the last two um potentially the last four or five years of a deal like this would be have those type of clauses tied to it. And uh, I, I think those will probably be in there. And I think the Mets will probably have some other um, potential options in there, yeah. um, different things. I mean, we might see it kind of the structure of it be potentially different than they had planned in terms of front loading the money as well. Right. Um, it, it, this this thing is going to, I mean, we're, we're talking about people um, that get paid specifically to do this, that are yep. homing over this with a fine tooth, the lawyers currently. Um, right. So it, it's taking them quite some time. And I, I do know that the, the holidays did play kind of a role yeah. in how this is being stretched out in terms of lawyers just simply not being available to look at the contracts and all the clauses and stuff. So yeah, I mean, that's where we're at. We're at the point where the, the Mets and Crea and Boris have essentially kind of agreed to some of this stuff and lawyers need to look over, make sure that this is going to go through, make sure it's in the best inter interest of both sides and kind yep. of sign off on this thing. And yeah, I, I, it, it'll be interesting to see just how how it plays out in terms of where the options are and all of that to see how the Mets kind of protected themselves in this deal. I, I like we've talked about, and I, I said it earlier, I, th this deal is going to get done is my assumption. I, I still haven't heard anything that to say otherwise um, other teams think it's going to get done. Yeah. So unless, unless there's some 24th hour, just madness of one of the two sides, just saying, Hey, this isn't going to work. This is just too much. Um, it's going to get, it's going to get done at some point. And uh, it, it, I think at this point, I think both teams would kind of like uh, both sides would kind of like it to be soonish. I mean, you don't want this to go into like a month or whatever. Right. right. Um, and the Mets would certainly like to start getting ready, prepping for pitchers and catchers. Uh, I know Steve Cohen doesn't have an engagement at city field in three days where he yep. is talking about, um, the acreage of uh, asphalt around city field. He wants to excited for up. that. That's a long time um, coming. Whether it's, I know there's talks of a casino, mm -hmm. but there's also some other different stuff. Um, so at city field on January 7th, um, you could RSVP to go to the event and kind of talk through uh, with Steve Cohen and the other folks that are going to be there about what, what it is that the people actually want to happen to that. Right area i mean that that's what he's really uh wants to do he, he wants to build it up i mean i obviously it, it's just been an area that's not great to be around a stadium and it would certainly be it would certainly be better for the mets and for steve cohen and the fans to be able to have an experience outside of the stadium like you do at a lot of parks i mean yeah. if you go to fen fenway for me that's the closest park there's so many bars and restaurants yep. and areas you can hit. Wrigleyville is, is the, the, the pinnacle of that. The area surrounding Wrigley is awesome. Yeah. You know that it's, it only helps and, you know, maybe bring the jets back to Wells point. Might, might as well, right. <laughs> put, put, put both teams back there, two new stadiums now, nah, but that's all good stuff. Um, you know, we, we figured Cohen would do something with that. Eventually it's, it's real estate that's been sitting there a long time. It's a lot of money to be made and someone like Cohen's not going to let money sit around, but uh, two quick notes before we finish up tonight. Uh, one, Mets hired Eric Hinsky as assistant hitting coach. Uh, wanted to get that, get that in there. And also uh, happened, I believe the announcement happened last week, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but Wayne Randazza was hired as the Angels' new lead TV play-by-play -play announcer. So sad for us as Mets fans. You know, we had Wayne on the show a few times. He's great to us. Was great on the radio with Howie. Uh, but, you know, big congratulations to him. That's really cool that he gets to, you know, land the job like that. But we'll certainly uh, miss him on the East Coast here. Yeah, it should certainly be kind of interesting to see who the the Mets land um, yeah. to replace him. I, I don't. I think hey, 
Josh Lewin is out there for the taking. Right. Um, I think that would certainly be a good fit. Um, Bring him home. That, I, yeah, I haven't really, I haven't heard a, a ton of names dropped out there yet. Um, well, it was it was just announced today officially that Randazzo was taking the gig. So, gotcha. I, I I guess they got some time. And well, well, we're talking about contracts. We might as well note that Keith Hernandez is still somehow technically a free agent. Forget um, Correa. Yeah. I don't care. Bring Keith back. That's priority number one. Keith's got whatever. I know it's SMY, so I don't know if uh, you know Fred and Jeff are doing uh, you know trying to hold things up here. But we got to get Keith signed. He's he's the backbone. Gary Keith and Ron, they've been here since the beginning. Now the team's good. You got to get him here. They got to they got to sign Keith. I'm assuming that will get done sooner rather than later. Keith's probably just hanging out and and you know or Fort Lauderdale wherever he hangs out. You know he he lives in the winter and he just he'll get to it when spring training starts. I guess. I can't imagine a better couple of days for Mets fans for them to get excited about uh, the Mets announcing Correa and SNY announcing Keith coming back. I, I, that would basically be like the icing on top of icing for the Maybe cake, that's what they're the waiting for. They want to do it on one day. That would be great. If they want to announce those on the same day, that would be uh, tremendous. But whenever it is, just get them both done relatively soon, please. Um, but you know, other than that, obviously I think that's going to put a, a bow on this week's show. Everything's kind of in limbo until this Correa deal happens, but you know, we'll be back here next week. Now the holidays are over. We'll be back to our weekly, usual weekly, uh, spots here, but hopefully by the next episode, we'll be talking about Correa officially signing a contract and being a Met. But until then, uh, let's go Mets guys. <laughs>